Hi, everybody. My name is Isabella Sudano, and I would like to introduce you in this session addressing the population question, interesting case profile in renal, renal denervation. My topic is to talk about known adherence, and here you will find my conflict of interest. Adherence is a topic that was for some time not really uh, under light. And we, if we see the result of this meta-analysis, we can see that even if there is a big change uh, between the studies, around 17% of the patients with uncontrolled hypertension were completely non-adherent. So they didn't take any drugs. And 44% they take just some drugs, but no, not all the therapy we suggest. There is also a difference between the drugs we can use. Um, we can see that the percent of the uh, drug, the difference between the prescribed drug and the drug that were detected in blood and urine is, for example, much bigger if you use a diuretic, if you use the beta blocker, or um, other kind of antihypertensive drugs. And that's really a pity because if patients are not adherent, they are going to a very uh, big risk. Um, in patients who are not adherent to medical drugs, there is an increase in risk of heart failure, coronary artery disease, and a big increase in the real risk of cerebrovascular disease here in this. Um, summary of data, 22%. We all know how important is blood pressure reduction. If we are able to reduce 10 millimeter of mercury in systolic blood pressure, we can avoid 20% of major cardiovascular disease, 27% of stroke, and 30% mortality. Anyway, adherence is difficult. There are many reasons for that. Patients are sometimes not really motivated to take drugs because they don't understand really the disease and they don't have a perception of the need or benefit from medication. Then there are some problems with the communication. Languages could be one or the limited time uh, between physician and patient uh, or complexity of the medical history or the medical regimens. And then we don't have to forget the socioeconomical part. Some people are maybe thinking, I can't pay my medication or they have concern about the cost that the medication um, causes. Last but not least, adherence to antihypertensive medication is a dynamic thing. There are patients who start as adherent and then with the time stop drugs, uh, some drugs or all drugs, and some other patients who were non-adherent at the beginning, they have a better understanding, for example, of the disease and they start to take drugs regularly. There are some predictors. Males seem uh, less keen on taking drugs than women, and but what is really important is the number of the prescribed drugs. If I have just one pill to take every day, there is the possibility that I took this long time, but if I take five or six or more drugs, then the possibility that I will become non adherence is pretty, pretty high. Patient preferences. We can explain how dangerous high blood pressure it is, how high the risk of uh, an event, uh, and uh, how this event can change my quality of life or my lifetime. And then let people decide if they would rather die early or take medication. And the result of this interesting study showed that a lot of people who give up some years of their life in order to avoid to take one pill daily all life long. And the same is if I have the possibility to choose something else than medication to reduce my blood pressure, would I do this? If you ask this to physician, around one third would say, okay, I will send you to intervention. But two thirds, so 70% of the patient 
could ask for this kind of intervention to avoid medication. So we need to keep in mind patient preferences. And there is this possibility. The data from the spiral hypertension of meds show that if you have hypertensive patient without medication and they are going on to have a renal denervation, then we have a consistent reduction in systolic and diastolic blood pressure, not only office blood pressure, but also, for me, more important, a reduction of 24-hour systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So I can explain the result of this study. There were 1,000 patients who were asked, you are not taking any drugs, would you take drug therapy or to try the intervention? And here we can say that 38% of the patients would indeed prefer an intervention before they are going to take re uh, regularly drugs. So a stay-home message. No adherence is widespread difficult to detect and dynamic, and sometimes a topic we are not really happy to talk about. But it's important to talk about it because it is directly associated with worsening outcome, including fatal and non-fatal stroke. Nona even said multiple influence that sometimes are beyond the control of the patient. And at the end, we need to face that non-adherence is an unmet clinical need to provide hypertension therapy that do not require lifelong daily dosing. So patient preference is a very important consideration for a successful hypertension management. Thank you for your attention. So hello to everybody. My name is Joachim Weil, and I'm happy to share some of my ideas about renal denervation for high-risk patients. Uh, this shows my conflict of interest. Let me start with the high-risk patient. What is a high-risk patient? So hypertensive patients are considered to be at a high risk of cardiovascular events if they have diabetes mellitus, if they have chronic kidney disease or cerebral vascular disease, as well as coronary heart disease and um, hypertension mediated, mediated end organ damage. So these characteristics are um, uh, for hypertensive patients at a high cardiovascular risk. And that's also um, shown in the current guidelines of the European Society um, of Cardiology. And you can see it's not only the degree of hypertension which um, determines the risk, but also the asymptomatic or symptomatic or established disease. And you can see even if you have uh, high normal or grade one um, hypertension and if you have established disease, you're at a very high risk. This leads me to the question if um, blood pressure reduction has a different impact on these patients. And actually, this has been shown in a nice meta-analysis a couple of years ago. That's a complicated slide. So on your left hand, you see systolic blood pressure. On your right hand, um, diastolic blood pressure. And uh, what you can see here is a reduction on blood pressure on one side. Um, dependent on the cardiovascular risk and the cardiovascular risk is shown in the Z axis. And as you can nicely see, if you have a low risk patient, a reduction of, for example, four millimeters of mercury does not have a big impact on total avoidable events in these patients. However, if you have a high risk patient, um, then the impact is much higher. And it's higher than if you have a big reduction in blood pressure and uh, in a high risk patient. And this holds true for systolic blood pressure as well as for diastolic blood pressure. But how are we doing right now? And that's shown here in the next slide. So lifelong Foley pharmacy is failing as a strategy to improve hypertension control. What you can see here is the incidence with a lower line over the last two decades in the US of hypertension, it's about 30%. And then you can see how many patients can we control. And it's even if we did a little better over a couple of years, we end up with a, 
about 50% of patients who can be controlled, um, who can be controlled by our drug um, treatment. So we definitely need other strategies to treat our patients. And as you have heard from uh, the speaker before, renal denervation is one option. So do we have any information on renal denervation uh, in these high-risk hypertensive patients? Yes, we do have. We do have the GSR registry, which is real-world data um, on patients with a high risk. And you can see here nicely work from Felix Mafud and colleagues, which show the reduction of um, blood pressure in the 24 hours ABPM over six, one year, six months, one year, two years, and three years in different groups. So in the first group, in the resistant group, but also in the elderly and the diabetic population, which are all patients with a high cardiovascular risk. And you can you nicely see there is a marked and clinical um, reduction of systolic blood pressure in all of these groups. Moreover, we have a very new um, data from also from the GSR registry, which show that even in patients with a high calculated cardiovascular risk, the reduction of blood pressure is good, even better than the ones with a low um, risk. And what you see here is a follow-up over six months up to three months. And with the light, um, with the light gray bars, you see the patients with the um, low cardiovascular risk. And on the other hand, with the dark bars, you see the ones with the high cardiovascular risk. And is, again, as you can nicely see, the reduction is about 15 millimeters of mercury over a time of three years. And this is, again, a meaningful reduction of blood pressure. There is another aspect which I think is very um, interesting. And that's shown on the next slide. You might know that mortality risk is more sensitive to nighttime systolic blood pressure um, as compared to the daytime blood pressure. And that's shown in this uh, nice work from Dr. Young uh, and coworkers from the last year. And we can see if you have a high blood pressure in the night, so let's say up to 140 in the night, then your risk is very high and um, much higher than when if the blood pressure is high or 140 during the day. This leads me to another aspect of renal denervation because as we know from the current data, renal denervation is like you put a switch on and that's shown here. So from the randomized trials, we show have shown a benefit of renal denervation over 24 hours. And what you see here is the results of the 24 hours ABPM profile in the hypertension off MET trial, which is on the upper side of this, slide and in the on-MET trial. And on the left-handed, you see the um, patients who got real innovation. On the right side, you see the control patients. You can nicely see the difference between um, baseline and um, after the follow-up, you, you, which is in the blue lines, there was no difference in the control group, but there was a marked difference over 24 hours, especially in the nighttime in these patients. So we have an, another interesting aspect of uh, treating patients with renal denervation. So taking together, which are the preferred candidates of renal denervation in my eyes? And I think that's a patient with so-called resistant hypertension because we do not really have other um, therapeutic options for these patients. Then patients with hypertension mediated organ damage, as I showed you before, because these are patients at a high risk. And then for sure, as we heard um, by the speaker before, the non-adherent or intolerant um, patients is another group which we may can um, treat with renal denervation in the future. All patients, as I have shown you, with uh, high cardiovascular risk as assessed by risk scores or with established disease may also um, benefit from um, renal denervation. Let me summarize and conclude my slides. So I think treatment of hypertension in high-risk patients can reduce cardiovascular events, and we do have many um, data showing that. The identification of high-risk patients by global risk evaluation is recommended for every hypertensive patient because 
it tells you if this patient is at risk or it is at lower risk. And I think for right now, we do have three pillars in the treatment of hypertension. First, the non-pharmacological interventions with lifestyle, et cetera, but you know how difficult it is to reach a lifestyle change in our patient. Then we have, importantly, the drug treatment, which still will be there. But nowadays, with the new data, I think we do have another option by intervention. So saying um, brilliant innovation offers uh, us a new um, tool to treat um, these patients. Thank you for your attention.